Maven family. If this is your first time with us, welcome. Bruchim Habaim. I, I'm so happy to have you here today. If this is your 20th or your 40th Maven event with us, welcome back. It's good to see you again. Um, today, we have the incredible Eliza Ben Shalom with us, who's bringing the ancient tradition of Jewish matchmaking and Shidduchim to Netflix, the public stage. She's bringing it to the world. <laughs> Aliza Ben Shalom is a renowned matchmaker, dating coach, author, and soulmate clarity expert, featured on the new Netflix series, Jewish Matchmaking. With over 15 years of experience, Aliza has successfully led over 200 singles through the steps to engagement, regardless of age, affiliation, or life stage. Her impressive track record has earned her the title of Jewish dating guru. And Aliza has authored two books and founded Marriage Minded Mentor, connecting singles globally with skilled matchmakers and dating coaches. Her relationship advice has been featured across various media platforms. Aliza has tried, has trained more than 300 dating coaches and matchmakers worldwide, and she now resides in uh, with her family in Pardes Hana, Israel, after realizing her lifelong dream of moving to Israel in March 2021. Aliza, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We are so excited to have you here. And you know what? We're just going to cut right to the chase because I know people are just dying to know, you know, what is your Jewish journey? If anyone's watched the show, we know that that's kind of one of the first questions that you ask folks is, you know, what's your Jewish journey? Tell us where, you know, your where your love of Judaism comes from or tell us about some of your Jewish practices. And, and I want to flip those tables really quick and ask you, <laughs> what, what so is fun. your Jewish journey? <laughs> what is your Jewish journey? And, and how how did you get to where you are today? So I like to say that I loved my Judaism, but I wasn't living my Judaism. So I grew up Jewish, conservative. We learned about everything. We knew it, but it wasn't traditionally a part of our practices. It's not how my parents were raised. It's not what we knew. Mm -hmm. And we learned about it, you know, in synagogue. We learned about it with our community, but we didn't bring a lot of that home. Um, I do remember my mom starting to keep kosher when I was younger, and that was something that stuck with us. And she did start to bring certain things in, but things like Shabbat, it wasn't really something that we knew about. It wasn't something that we practiced. Mm -hmm. So I, all along my childhood, I had this passion, this desire, this, this drive to be Jewish, to live Jewishly, to experience Judaism, to connect with other Jewish people. And I slowly over the years started to do more things, probably from things like USY and BBYO, which are youth groups in the conservative movement and reform movement. And I was able to really connect more with my Judaism. And then Hillel in mm -hmm. at the University of Pittsburgh, I was president, I was social chair, you name it, I did it. Well, I didn't know we had so much in common. Hello, presidents unite. <laughs> yes. awesome. Yeah, I have a gavel from somewhere. My kids are like, oh, I want that. I was like, don't Love hit it. your brother over the head. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And, uh, and so I taught, took Jewish leadership roles after I graduated from college and I studied Jewish studies in college. I learned some Hebrew. I came to Israel. I did an ulpan to learn more Hebrew and to kind of live and learn in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with Israel. I, I didn't have the guts to stay. I didn't have the infrastructure. I didn't have the support network. So I didn't stay. I went back home and I was kind of really sad and depressed. Mm -hmm. I was like, <laughs> I yeah. love Israel and I love being Jewish and I just want to be there and I just couldn't make it happen. And then I went on Jewish retreats and I met people and all that I had learned about Judaism at, at a certain point in my mid twenties, I was like, oh, I love it mm -hmm. and I want to do it. So I'm going to start doing it. But when you start actually not just knowing about your Judaism, but practicing your Judaism, they call mm -hmm. you orthodox. So <laughs> yes. somewhere along the way, it's like, oh, I'm going to, I made like a few decisions. I'd like to keep Shabbat. Mm -hmm. I'd like to keep kosher. Mm -hmm. I'd like to learn how to pray. I think, you know, God's kind of a good thing in the world. And I'd like to connect. And um, dressing modestly, I think that that's a beautiful um, way of being and living in the world. I want to do that too. And mm -hmm. so I took those things on and all of a sudden I was accidentally orthodox. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that's yeah, a whole other show, accidentally orthodox. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't trying to become anything. I just loved my Judaism. And I decided yeah. to start living and practicing some of my Judaism more consistently and more regularly. Sure. And I ended up Orthodox and I 
I just embraced my Judaism. I thank God found my husband shortly after that. We got married and poof, 20 years later, here we are. Wow. And did you find your husband through a matchmaker? Uh, so we were at a retreat and it was a Jewish singles retreat and we kind of met, we actually left dating other people, but we came back to Philadelphia mm -hmm. and we were in the community together at Shabbat dinners and we would see each other around. And he asked me to go for like a walk one night after Shabbat. Would you like to go for a walk? I was like, sure. That sounds lovely. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it all begins. <laughs> and, and then I was like, okay, so like new, like, let's go out again. And he's like, yeah, you have to go talk to, um, the rabbi. And I was like, what? I don't really want to talk to the rabbi. I want to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the rabbi in the community, uh, was our, um, appointed matchmaker. Sometimes there's a matchmaker that sets you up and sometimes there's a matchmaker that leads and guides you through the process. And mm, he was okay. appointed to be our matchmaker. Cause that was who my husband knew and trusted. And mm -hmm. he guided us through the process to get us to where we are now. Wow. Okay. That is a beautiful story. Um, I feel like a lot of people can resonate with the, the walk, like, Hey, let's go for a walk. And next thing you know, right. However, many years later, married kids, the whole nine yards, <laughs> but that's beautiful. <laughs> really, really beautiful. You know, in talking about matchmaking and especially within, you know, your, your role as a matchmaker on the Netflix show, I'm curious to know where you have all of these, uh, fun sayings that, that you create, right. You have analysis paralysis, date them till you hate them, mystery in your history. Are these things that you have like have come up with over the years? Did you tell, tell me about the creation of these, uh, analogies? Okay. So I had this aha moment through these interviews. It like came to me because people were like, is this like made up for the show? I was like, no, yeah. this is my, this is my stuff. This is what I tell people. Yeah. So what happened is over the years, I would teach different concepts to people and mm. I would give them over and over and over again. And I was constantly, constantly refining what I said and how I said it. Mm. And it came to a point where I said, I would come up with how to say it. And it was really clever. Uh, I would call it a little bit poetic, a little bit playful, definitely memorable. Mm -hmm. So between poetic, playful, and memorable, if it mm -hmm. hit those three categories, it was something that stuck. And then people remembered it. So mystery in your history. I'm like, right. That means we go back into your history. We, we pull out somebody and I pick a match from somebody you are already connected to. And they're like, nah, there's nobody. I'm like, great. Well, 35% of you are wrong because 35% <laughs> of you will marry somebody from your history. And wow. I'm pretty sure I could find him. So I'm not looking in my black book in the future of, ooh, Mr. or Mrs. Wonderful. I'm going to look in your mm -hmm. black book first. And they're like, no, there's really nobody. I'm like, oh. Thanks for the challenge. It is accepted. <laughs> so oh, so wow. things like that developed into courses. Okay. History in your history is a course uh, that I offer. Mm. Uh, date them till you hate them is just a philosophy that I have to get people not to break up very quickly because we just don't have enough data and information. I just need everybody to buy into the process. Yeah. And it's really helpful when we have people following a set of guidelines where they don't have to put so much effort into it. Like, oh, I don't know what to do. Well, you don't know what mm -hmm. to do because you don't have enough data and information. And when you have it, you're going to make a very good decision. But today is not your decision day. So mm -hmm. please do me a favor. Date them till you hate them. When in doubt, go out. Hang on. No analysis paralysis. Don't hold yourself. Oh, yes. No, yes. No. We'll deal with that in five dates. Keep dating. Let's yeah. do five. Oh, I have, I have a five date challenge. That's like a free course that I offer and mm. anybody can try it. And it just it, videos and worksheets, and it just gets you into a mindset of what to do and how to do it without gumming up the works. People are like, Oh, no. if I only knew what to do, I would do it the right way. But mm -hmm. since I don't know what to do, whatever, whatever I feel, whatever happens <laughs> in the moment, I'm like, eh, it's not always yes. the right thing. <laughs> yeah. It seems like a lot of millennials and now, you know, Gen Z are finding that, you know, when we date, it's such a one-off progress, right? It's swiping, it's seeing someone for the first time. Eh, I don't know about them. You move on to the next one, right? So this challenge, this five date challenge sounds very, very interesting. And and truly a challenge for millennials and Gen Z who are so used to just, just swiping left and right and saying no right away if they don't meet every single, you know, aspect that you're looking for. So that's, 
That is really, really interesting, you know, but, but thinking about that, you know, I believe too, that millennials and Gen Z, we believe that we, we know more, like we know about ourselves more. A lot of us perhaps go to therapy. A lot of us do a lot of reading when it comes to, you know, attachment styles, love languages. How many TikToks have we seen from relationship coaches and experts, you know, trying to tell us, you know, what's healthy about a relationship, what's not healthy about a relationship. Do you find that all of this excess of information is a positive or is it a detriment to people looking for love today? I think knowledge is power. And I think people need to know what is knowledge and what Mm -hmm. is just information and excess and things that we could really filter out. So something like the five love languages is fantastic, incredible principles there that are really very rooted in Jewish values uh, and points of connection between building a relationship. There's, Mm -hmm. there's so many blessings that come out of those teachings. That's something fantastic to follow, but the most recent relationship hack that you might see on TikTok, maybe it's good. Maybe it's not. I don't know. (laughs) I've seen some advice where I looked at it and I went, Oh no, no, don't do that. I even, I once wrote to somebody online. I was like, listen, I respectfully disagree. I, you know, I have a different philosophy and I I gave a little explanation. It opened up a whole conversation with a private chat happening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and it was a very respectful conversation, but not everything that I see, do I believe and follow. So I think that there's tremendous wisdom in the world today, more so than ever. We have access to almost anything you want to know, you can figure it out through a program like this, through the University of YouTube, through Google, through chat GPT. I mean, there's so many ways to learn, but the question is, what is knowledge and what is entertainment and what is just information that you probably shouldn't follow? Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. We definitely have to discern what information is coming at us from where, who are the experts, you know, but also what resonates with us. It's funny that you mentioned chat GPT because I've had friends who are like, (laughs) ask chat GPT. <laughs> okay. I met this person. Here's their information. Should I still go out with them? And they will listen to chat GPT, which is AI is just a whole nother phenomenon that we are now dealing with. <laughs> I mean, listen, I've used chat GPT. I test it. I try yeah. it. It's not necessarily bad information. The question totally. is, uh, so if I get information, I could tell you good information, bad information, but this is totally my industry. If you're not an Mm -hmm. expert in this area, it's just information. And the question is, how do you know where it is? But much of it happens to be outstanding. It's, it's television, internet. It's a matter of what you tune into and Mm -hmm. what you follow and what you trust. Yeah. And, and it could be for the greatest good, or it could just be a waste of time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And speaking of, you know, waste of time, greater good, you know, I would noticed that in, and and this might've been just something that like I honed in on, it might not have been a pattern, but something that I noticed in the show is that more often than not, the men go into their dates blind, whereas the women, all the women always get to see who their date is before. Maybe that's just how it was filmed. Maybe that's not the reality, but is there a method to that kind of madness? It's interesting that that wasn't intentional um, on our end and and how we did it. Um, it, There were a lot of factors behind the scenes. Let's call it, you know, on reality dating versus in the real (laughs) world dating and a lot of factors of time and travel and who and what and what was easier. Mm -hmm. But if somebody is open to a blind date and I have a handle on who they are and have a handle on what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. I personally would prefer that because mm-hmm. the other option is you have now Googled everything about them. You've lost your sense of curiosity. You don't mm-hmm. actually want to know anything about them because you think you know yeah. them. And then your first date is a failure because you didn't even make right. an effort because why should you make an effort? Because eh, you, yeah. you, you feel that you know them. So I do happen to like blind dates, but it's not blind to me. Meaning Mm -hmm. I didn't just randomly pick somebody out of a hat. It was a conscious choice based on what somebody's preferences are. And sometimes I'm looking to stretch somebody to see how far within their range we can go. I'm happy to give somebody exactly what they want if we have that available. And if we don't, then I want to know how far can we stretch to give you what you're looking for. And it removes the anxiety. People have so much less anxiety when I don't really know what I'm getting myself into. So I'll just show up with a smile on my face and it just it almost makes it a little bit better. So th- that just happened to be that way. I think that it was a uh, just a, an outcome of production and timing sure. and how to move through the process. But uh, sure. I would 
I would prefer it if people are okay with it. I love it. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's no, definitely. Reason. I don't know you. I know nothing about, not that I know nothing about you, but you know, I know you're within yeah. all these ranges of what works for me, but I don't know the nuances and the details. Like yeah. Danny said something like pleasant surprises, you know, like yeah, I, yeah, if yeah. I tell you everything, what are you going to ask? You're going to have nothing yeah. to say. You're going to go, oh, I know Elisa said this. I know Elisa said that. I know Elisa said this. What, what kind of a date is that? You're right. going out with me or you're going out with them? <laughs> definitely. And do you find that that's sometimes a struggle? Like when you're helping individuals out where they're like, feel like they're, I don't know, dating you is like not, maybe not the right word, but like they're relying on you so heavily that they're seeing that other person like through you almost. Yes. So, and, and I tend to have a, well, obviously I'm setting it up because I believe it could work vision and I don't want to heavily influence their personal vision. Mm -hmm. I want them to come to uh, liking and connecting with somebody on their own, not through my sure. eyes. I mean, at first, yes, I want you to see the good and see what I see. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the date, I need to know there was some sort of a connection. And you do really like each other and there's something yeah. there. So it, again, it does, it does kind of help to do blind dating. Um, often we do in the more religious world, um, should a resume dating, or we'll call yes. it dating profile dating. So we'll give you a whole profile name, where you're from, your city, community references, what schools wow. you went to, the family details has everything on that profile. And yeah. then you review it, you do some investigation and you see if it works. Um, that's often how we do it, or we can do it through online matches mm-hmm. or through, you know, yeah, the possibilities are endless, <laughs> endless. totally. <laughs> When, so you, you know, we talked about earlier, you work with folks all over the Jewish spectrum, right? You work with folks from Orthodox all the way down, Reconstructionists or just Jewish. Is, is it easier to make a match for the Orthodox community or the secular Jewish community? Ooh, ooh, nobody has asked me that. <laughs> gotcha. oh, think, this is, this is the sound of thinking. You're going to hear nothing for a second. Go for it. Uh, the Orthodox Jewish community, I know, is motivated for marriage. Hmm. The secular Jewish community, I know, is motivated for a relationship. I know is open to marriage. And some of them are more or less marriage minded. And some of them haven't made a decision yet. And so it's easier to make a match where we know the outcome and and what we want to get out of it and having so many people on the same page. Oh, you're all marriage minded. Great. We just took away a huge question mark. So that does make it easier. Mm -hmm. The nuances and details of the every little uh, religious difference and similarity. And if it works, and if it doesn't in my community, in your community, Mm -hmm. that's definitely a great challenge. I think we saw that also on the show with Faye and Shia, there were religious differences and some people are going, oh, that's no big deal. And I'm going, no, it's a big deal. And it it was a discussion, which, you know, are you leaning this way? Are you leaning this way? Are we leaning in towards each other? Are we kind of not really heading the same way? Wow. We have chemistry, but chemistry isn't enough. And we need to see if, if our values are really in alignment. And at the end of the day, it wasn't the right fit. Mm -hmm. So that makes it more difficult, but I would say also in the secular Jewish community. So you're Jewish, but what does that mean? You reform, reconstructionist, conservatox, traditional flexodox, which is my new, um, I love that by the way, favorite term, right? Flexodox. I love that. (laughs) It just describes so much, which means uh, to me, it means I love my Judaism. I love lots of things about my Judaism. I'm not following to the letter of the law, everything of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. I'm within a range of doing things and not doing things. I'm learning, I'm growing and I'm shifting and, and I'm in, I'm in, I buy into God. I buy into the Jewish people. Yeah. What do I do about it? Ah, I'm flexidox. (laughs) I don't know exactly what I do. We'll have to talk about each little thing. Do you find that there's more of that flexidox in Israel or, or here in the States? Israel kind of has their buckets of yeah. types of I'm religious, I'm secular, I'm this type of religious. Uh, it's less common here. I think traditional would be mm-hmm. the term that people would use in Israel. Yeah. And in America, traditional has kind of shifted a little, which mm-hmm. means Traditional is not always the appropriate label, which is why Flexidox is an appropriate label. So I think that it is actually more of 
uh, a non-Israeli type of title. I don't know if it's only the United States. I do feel like Europe has a lot of flexidox where they're also, they fall into a bucket of traditional, um, very often, you know, we will go to synagogue every Friday night, but we drive. Okay. Well, what is that? Well, that's not Orthodox. Okay. But that's not secular either. It's traditional slash flexidox. There is, there's amount of flex. There's amount of movement there where I'm doing things and mm-hmm. yet I'm doing it in a way that works for me. And I think Definitely. that's the definition. Do you feel like that that sector of Judaism is growing more than the others? Do you find more like that you're catering to that group more now? I have found it to be growing and I find it fascinating. I will see people from both ends, either mm. religious and heading towards Flexidox or secular and also heading towards Flexidox. And neither one wants to totally be in the other position. Mm -hmm. They just want that middle of the road flavor. And traditional also means it's within my tradition. It's within my lineage. It's within my family. We did this. So we do that. Mm. We lit candles on Friday night. We went to Shabbat services. We had dinner together. And then we turned on the television and we did these other things. It was with, but traditionally we did these things. Flexidox, and this is, I'm having an aha moment, so I'm so excited because I've never (laughs) explained it like this, but Flexidox does not mean it was within my tradition. It could have been within my tradition. Mm -hmm. It could be I grew into it. It could be I grew out of my tradition and I'm growing into myself and my Judaism Mm -hmm. in a way that I want to live within the world. And Flexidox almost means to me, I am creating the traditions that I want to carry on. Whereas traditional is something I'm carrying on from past generations. Wow. That's very powerful. That's, That's new. Very, very powerful. <laughs> I've never said that before. <laughs> you, heard, you heard it here, folks. You heard it first here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> the new explanation of Flexidox. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. And I'm sure that brings up a lot of um, changes in the way that you are approaching the folks that you're helping find matches and the way that hopefully other matchmakers are, are, are taking an approach to helping people find their people. And I, I hope it makes it easier, not harder <laughs> in that case for them I to think, kind of find each other. I think that it does. And I think it also open up, opens up worlds. So yeah. you see the world today, we are not very black and white. Lots of things are very, very gray. And I think our Judaism is also gray. So it's mm-hmm. not religious, secular, and there's yeah. nothing in between. It's there are religious people in the world. There are secular people in the world. And then there's this whole lovely middle category of flexidox people who are living and loving their Judaism in the way that they're doing it. And they're kind of doing that dance. I had one woman tell me, Aliza, I've got one foot in the secular world and I've got one foot in the religious world. I am going to go out on Saturdays and do my thing Saturday day for Shabbat. But Friday night, I light my candles and I go to shul and we have dinner. And and that's it. That's how (laughs) I'm going to live my life. I said, okay. And then I told her, I said, you need to really look for like a British guy because they're traditional yeah. slash flexidox. They have that. They're kind of doing that. And wouldn't you know, a couple of <laughs> months or whatever later, she met a British guy and it was oh. a perfect match for her. It was a great fit. Wow. Oh my gosh. Well, hey, listen to the expert. You say British. <laughs> hey, you got to find the British guy. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Canadians also work well with that. They have a lot of tradition there. Israelis also have a lot of tradition. South yes. Africans, Australians, there's that traditional slash flexidox comes in Absolutely. more. It's interesting in America, it's coming about now, but I feel like in other communities, traditional is kind of mm-hmm. mixing into that flexidox world and, and America is kind of growing into it. Yes, no, 100%. I see that all around us, especially with American Jewish University and the folks that we serve, among other organizations that I've been a part of, like Moisha House, Pardes, right? There's so much more accessibility to the masses, and it's really honing in on that flexidox, you know, but also for folks who grew up Orthodox, who grew up secular, to find what Judaism means to them. So this is just one other way why, you know, where they can find their Judaism through the matchmaking process, which I think it's quite beautiful. Um, I want to take a look at some of the Q&A. We have so many questions from, from our audience, and I do want to make sure that we get to them. So let me see, let me see, is, you know, the thing that I love about this, this particular conversation that we're having, it's very personal, right? So the folks that are watching, a lot of them are asking specific questions um, about, you know, like their kids, their grandkids, their friends' kids, right? This is this kind of how it is, but 
I, I, I do want to approach it. So what do you, okay. So we have Linda. Thank you, Linda, for your question. What do you suggest re a daughter who is super picky and won't go out with anyone who doesn't check all of her boxes? Right. So here's how I deal with quote, super picky people. First of all, you all had preferences and I had preferences when I was looking for my person. Nobody sees themselves as picky. Everybody is more picky than them. So first Let's just take a deep breath and go, yes, I had preferences too. And I would say, great, what are all the boxes? And then she's going to tell you, he has to have a certain look and a certain job and a certain level of income and a certain type of family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And she's going to tell you that list. And then you tell her back, you're looking for this and this and this and this and this and this, right? And she goes, yep. And you're like, okay. And I'll keep my eye out. And if I see anybody, I'll let you know. And then you meet somebody who has some of her list, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, don't tell her, he's amazing. He's exactly what you're looking for. No, he's not. He's not exactly what you're looking for. I'd rather you go to her and say, listen, I know that you are looking for all of these things, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and the rest of the alphabet. You are looking for those things. Let me tell you what I know about him. He fits certain boxes. I'm not so sure about the family background. I'm not so sure about the job, if that's going to be a perfect fit for you. Are you open to giving this a chance and perhaps going out and seeing if we could set this up? Ask a question. Don't tell them what they should do. Invite them to the conversation and see what they say. If she goes, no, I told you what I want and that's the only thing I want. Go, okay, next. And then mm -hmm. maybe you find somebody for her and maybe she just waits and maybe it's one year and maybe it's 10 years. <laughs> I can't tell you the timeline, but over time, people will either get what they want mm -hmm. because they waited for it, they looked for it, and they know it exists, or they will shift what they're looking for and grow into what works for them, but you will not force them out of it. Please do not force them out of it. It's mm -hmm. kind of like breaking an arm and then having to reset it. Just leave her be. She's going to figure it out. Either give her what she's looking for or close enough to it and identify what doesn't work because that gives you more credibility. That says, you know her, you understand her, and you're receiving what she's saying, and therefore she's more likely to trust you now and in the future. Hmm. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And Linda, I hope you hope you heard that, and good luck with uh, with your search for your daughter. Um, there's a couple questions here uh, discussing your openness to working with folks from the LGBTQIA plus community. Is that something, do you work with openly queer clients? It's not my area of expertise and to be respectful of all peoples and all communities. So I grew up in the religious, uh, the secular community. I became observant. So I have a familiarity with both of those. I have an understanding mm -hmm. and it makes sense. And I've kind of like studied it extensively, but that community is not a community that I have um, a, an extensive network in or B, um, really a deep understanding of how it works. But sure. what I do have is an extensive network of matchmakers. And I have two outstanding matchmakers that are in Philadelphia that awesome. uh, work with the LGBTQ community. And uh, I make referrals whenever I get inquiries. They're like, do you work with us? Will you do this? Will you do that? I say, yeah. it's not my area of expertise, but I have the right network for you. And I make a connection. And I think that's what a good matchmaker should do. I think a matchmaker should connect the right people together. And that's, that's how I am able to be supportive. That's fantastic. Yeah. And it's good to remind the people watching that, like you said, you have this network of matchmakers. It's not just you, right? Like running the world. Well, you are kind of running the world in the matchmaking world, but it's you. I'm glad, <laughs> because... I'm glad to be running the matchmaking world. And I have over a thousand matchmakers exactly. worldwide that are yes. serious matchmakers and about 2000 with like what we call yeah. dabblers or, or I'm renaming them to like fiddlers. They like play a little fiddlers. bit with matchmaking, you know, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. And uh -huh. they're like, oh, I'll try this. So we have thousands okay. of matchmakers across the globe and we're training more. We did a, uh, an international training in Jerusalem in April. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We, please God are bringing that to other communities around the world. And that is really my I'm going to call it chesed, nonprofit, give back. Mm -hmm. um, it's expensive to do. We have to find donors in every city, but we're not charging matchmakers to get trained because mm -hmm. we want to, they, they do so much and um, they often don't have a, a for-profit model. They work for nonprofits or it's a chesed yeah. model, which is um, how matchmaking was you know designed. And I think that I just want to give back and I just want people to be trained so they know what to do and how to do it. And uh Please God, we'll have an army of matchmakers trained over the next year or two. That's beautiful. I feel like they need a like a, a training for Hillel and Moisha House for yes. <laughs> the residents and like leadership. 
Yes, yes, yes. Because anybody can be a matchmaker. You don't have to be somebody who's married yourself to be a coach. I love my coaches and the mentors to be people that are married, that have the relationship experience, but to be a matchmaker, anybody can be a matchmaker. 100%. Hundred percent. And can can we assume that you also have some matchmakers that work with the fifty five plus crowd as well? Absolutely. They awesome. the fifty five plus crowd um, often feels like kind of like you know like there's like the lost generation or the forgotten yeah. generation. Yeah. I think that in matchmaking it feels very much like that. Uh, the oldest client that I've worked with was eighty nine, and she did find love. And she was very happy. And we only, we had a very short lived um, working relationship because we did some coaching and support to figure out what was going on and how to find somebody. And we kind of just tweaked it. Uh, But absolutely, we have um, a 55 plus community. We have, I have so many different things running. Like we're going to run something out of Israel called Soulmates at Sea. And we're going to actually have a cruise ship with 30s, 40s, 50s plus. Uh, wow. coming on on a cruise and doing a singles cruise with like the love boat the Jewish love boat <laughs> the Jewish love boat that's what it is that's awesome wow oh my gosh okay fantastic another question that's being asked a bunch of times is um when you were asked to let me see when you were asked to be on this Netflix show right a Netflix show called Jewish matchmaking we know that there's been a lot of anti-semitism in the media we know that there's been a lot of orthodox skewing programs on Netflix Hulu Prime that had a bit of negative backlash towards the Jewish community um were you afraid of any backlash from from the show in particular I was prepped to expect anything and kind of mm-hmm. expect the worst and whatever happens will happen. So I was I was prepped to expect, you know, death threats and crazy mm-hmm. things because that's what's been happening in the world. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, for my family, our, you know, safety is is the number one concern. Yeah. Um, and I have to say that I have received such an outpouring of love where I can tell you it almost makes me cry. Every time I meet people, they don't just say hello. They're like, hi, I love you. Can I give you a hug? And they come over. And (laughs) and it's just so powerful. And and men, women, older, younger, just doesn't matter. They're like, you even, Mm -hmm. even I I met an 11 year old, a couple of them actually. And they're like, we love your show. It's so wonderful. And it's just, oh, it's it's so amazing to meet you. And this is incredible. Mm -hmm. So um, I have just seen such an outpouring of love, which I think is so opposite of what is happening and what I expected to happen. Yeah. And I'm extremely, extremely grateful that it is having this effect on the world because I want to say, look, there's not only negative things happening to Jews in the world. There yeah. is something beautiful. There is a positive light. We are shining it on the world and it is going to light up the world. And I'm not going to stop until the whole world is lit and excited and passionate about this because there isn't much that's happening that that gets good publicity and good light. There's yeah. a lot of heaviness that's happening in the world right now with the Jews. And if this can be the light, this would be my greatest gift. Oh, that's beautiful. That's fantastic. And, and kind of going back to, you know, Netflix and how did they approach you? How did Netflix approach you? How did you become the Jewish matchmaker on Netflix? Okay. A good matchmaking story. A matchmaker helps. Yes. <laughs> so it's very funny. They were casting for it because there was a show called Indian matchmaking. Yes. And this is the spinoff of that with Jewish matchmaking. And that was a success. They said, great, we're going to renew that. And hey, let's do a Jewish matchmaking show. We got to find a Jewish matchmaker. And one of my matchmaker friends was called by casting. And they said, you know, we want to interview you. She said, for what? They said, a Jewish matchmaking show. She said, I don't want to do that. What is it? And they told her what it was. And she said, you don't want me. I don't want to do anything like that. But I work with Aliza. We've been doing seminars and trainings for matchmakers and coaches because we train matchmakers and coaches around the world. Also online, we have courses. She goes, Aliza, she'll always have something to tell you. She's good on the spot. You could ask her anything. Here's her number. You should call her. (laughs) And she calls me. She goes, casting is calling you. You should apply. This is a good thing. I don't know what it is, but you're going to like it. I told them they're going to love you. And I was like, oh, thank you. I love you so much. That's wow. A match made a match made in heaven, really a match made in Netflix. Yeah, <laughs> That's great. And then, so once they called you and they said, Hey, we're doing this thing. Did you know it was Netflix or was it still kind of a mystery? Um, 
I think at first it was a mystery because there was actually another production company calling about another show. Mm. And I was looking into different things and I kind of, I was having this conversation with God and I was like, listen, I want to do something big in the world. I want to light up the world. I want to be an inspiration. I want to, I want to do so much to do so much good in the world. You pick the show that's the greatest good. I'm going to do a show, but don't give me a bad show. <laughs> Only give me something that's going to be good for the Jewish people. Please yeah. pick the right thing. And I think at first I didn't really know that it was this. It was just, there's something coming, a Jewish show. And then it was like, well, did you see Indian matchmaking? And well, it's the same producers and, oh, okay, that's Netflix. And, and it like leaked out a little bit over time. Wow. Okay. So then soon, soon by you, it was like, all right, Netflix, we're doing it. And how long was the production process? How long did it take you to film and, and then, you know, finally have it out in the world? We filmed from February of 2002 or 20, 2022 to okay. August of 2022. So it was a seven month filming wow. and it came out in May, May 3rd of 2023. Um, it was four weeks in America. Then I got to be with my family in Israel, then two weeks of filming in Israel, then a couple more weeks with my family, then three weeks in America, wow. <laughs> back and forth for seven months. Oh my gosh. And I, another question that I'm getting a lot uh, is there going to be a season two? <laughs> okay, here's the deal. <laughs> they told me that if all you watch one through eight and they see that you love it, that is the only way that you can co quote cast your vote for it is by watching episodes one through eight. And if you watch okay. and everybody is watching, they're going to go, wow, people must like this because they watched the whole series. Yeah. Then we will get renewed. But uh, I just make a quick blessing. You guys can all say I mean in your own places. Please, God, the right thing for the right time that we should have another season two and more wonderful Jewish stories to tell. Amen. <laughs> because blessings are really the way to open up the world and unlock yeah. the mysteries. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. All right. We're all we're all praying. We're all praying for a season two. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, <laughs> let me move into some more of these fabulous, fabulous questions. Um let me see. So there's one that there's a couple questions here and I, I kind of want to flip it on its head if we don't mind, but there's a couple questions about interfaith relationships and, and I'm seeing it in here as more of a negative. Um, how can we avert people away from interfaith marriages or how can we, you know, you know, stop interfaith marriages or interfaith relationships and, you know, just going into my own personal story, my, my parents are the product of, you know, my parents are interfaith, my mom's Jewish, my dad's not, you know, I'm currently in an interfaith relationship. And, you know, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart. And as someone who grew up very actively Jewish, my dad never converted, but you would never know. He goes to all the services. He is an active participant. Right. Um, and so I want to flip these questions on their head in a more positive light. And I want to say, you know, are you, do you believe that someone's neshama can be Jewish, even if they were not born Jewish? And do you believe that you know, interfaith marriages can provide a source of beauty and uh, diversity to the Jewish world as we know it? It's a great question. I think that there are neshamas in this world that have the potential or desire to be Jewish. Mm -hmm. And there are people that take and make that action in the world and say, yes, I will do it. They do the process of conversion uh, and they're welcomed into the Jewish community. Uh, and I think that there's also neshamas in this world that are just good, incredible human beings mm -hmm. um, that don't happen to be Jewish. They don't choose to be Jewish. And that's just a part of um, their journey. In yeah. terms of relationships, it's difficult to maintain any relationship, put, put interfaith aside, oh, yeah. bringing two people together and going, Hey, let's play house. Would you like to get married? Let's live together for a lifetime. You don't <laughs> pick anybody else. I won't pick anybody else. We'll figure out financial things, moving life, work, children, everything is extremely challenging. And I think when we add the layer of interfaith on there, it makes it more challenging. And if we look at the statistics, they're not really in favor of a of the marriages lasting as long, although for sure um, they can, mm -hmm. but it's not statistically proven to be uh, greatly, uh, widely successful. And the challenge also is for children. And mm -hmm. one of the greatest challenges is 
I don't know who I am. And so even in interfaith relationships, it's very often recommended, pick one, pick one yeah. thing, raise a child, let them know who they are, let them have and own an identity. If they want to do something different later on, they can always choose it. But when they're very clear about who they are, it makes moving in the world so much easier. Yeah. So um, for those reasons, it's, I, I think it's, a difficult path to choose. Um, you know, you've lived it, you've been a part of it. Um, it sounds like your parents have gracefully uh, embraced it and that your dad is kind of like you said, like he's on board, but he's not a member of the tribe, but he's on board. And that's really beautiful. Um, the blending of two different, you know, backgrounds and things like that, I think is, is challenging for a couple and challenging for a family. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for the greatest path to success and longevity for a marriage to last a lifetime. And sure. it doesn't statistically provide that. Sure. No, I definitely understand that from the, from the statistical perspective and just being like the Jewish matchmaker, that also makes a lot of sense. The other thing is if your Judaism is really important to you, how are you going to carry that on? Like, does it matter mm -hmm. that Jews will be in the world after this generation? If it doesn't matter to you so much, then you have your answer. But if it does yeah. matter to you, then what are you doing about it to be a part of building that future? And how do you want to build that future? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's wonderful too, that like the folks that are coming to you, right? Like, you know, that they want to see Judaism in the future. Like they want to build that Jewish life. And so that kind of makes it a little easier, right? Than just going out in the world and trying to, you know, find another Jewish person and maybe they're not, investing in not Judaism. Everybody. Yeah, you didn't see everything. Not everybody was a hundred percent committed to only dating Jewish. Sometimes yeah. it was the first time that they were considering to date Jewish. Sure. And this was something really new for them. And and the question was, you know, well, will you continue to do this after like if we find your person, great. But if we don't, yeah. will you continue to do this on your own? <laughs> and a lot of people said, yes, I'm very inspired to do that now. I didn't even realize that I could sure. do this. Um, but not everybody was a hundred percent committed. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, and just to give you a little bit of the inside. We'll yeah, yeah, give us some that. inside scoop for sure. Behind the scenes. I love it. What, um, hold on. Someone asked specifically, okay, here, um, speaking of the folks, you know, who we saw on Jewish matchmaking, you know, whatever happened to specifically Bruce is asking, whatever happened to Ori, whatever happened to Harmony? So supposedly there's going to be a stories that are kind of leaking out and they're going to share yeah. all, all of the details uh and we're not exactly supposed to share them because everybody's got to finish the whole series and then stay okay fair. there should be there should be updates coming but I will just say if you have any ideas for people there are some people that I might still be able to help you out with oh, <laughs> so. yeah, all right all right hey good to know and and you know how can someone you know if there is a season two or if they do want to reach out to you not even just to be on the show but just to reach out to you um you know how can how can they do that and you know we'll share that in the chat as well so if you want to be on a season two please god there should be one amen amen and you <laughs> should watch all eight episodes. And then uh, if you want to just put yourself in my free database so that you're there, we will use anybody who we're connected with. We'll give them a heads up. Hey, casting uh, has started. Yay. We're going to, we're going to do this. Uh, and that that's kind of how we're going to let people know there'll be, a, you know, like there'll probably be a lot of chatter and a worldwide announcement and people will go crazy. Yeah, yeah um, of course. But, but if you're in our database and you're somebody kind of in our network, we a have a lot more details on you and b we can make recommendations to casting and say wow we we know somebody from somewhere and and take a look at this person um nice. so they can go to our website at marriagemindedmentor.com okay. and they can find out more about that um and in general you can go to our website we have courses we have coaches we have matchmaking opportunities online we have kind of our higher level um more professional matchmaking with people that are highly motivated and want a lot of support to have personalized introductions. We, we work with everybody who um, wants support at any level, whether it's high, medium, or low, we have all different options. And Fantastic. matchmakers, and matchmakers, if you want to be trained, we want yes. you. <laughs> we, I mean, not that I can bring everybody onto my team, but the greater Jewish world wants you to do matchmaking and we want you on our matchmaking in our, in our matchmaking network. Gosh, maybe we have to have a, a Maven class, a matchmaking Maven class. 
I feel like that might be something that our folks are super into. Yes. I'm getting the thumbs up from our tech. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I honestly, I think that would be fabulous. And, you know, just from the, the response that we've had on our program and just really the world response for, for Jewish matchmaking on Netflix, I think that would be really, really popular. All right. So stay tuned folks. Maybe we'll have a, an official <laughs> uh, Jewish matchmaking class for everyone. <laughs> Um, but with that, we only have a minute left. Is there anything um, that you would like to share? Um, you know, uh, last any last remarks for for the folks tuning in today? So I love when people ask this. I will end with a traditional Eliza blessing. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be whether you're single or whether you want to help somebody who's single. May each and every one of you be successful in finding the right person or helping somebody find the right person. May it happen with ease and may it happen this year. Amen. Um, but thank you again for being here. And Eliza, thank you again so much for being here with us today, sharing your Jewish wisdom and just sharing you. Thank you for having me.